Welcome to the 10th annual Boston Real Abilities Film Festival. My name is Kat Kareshka and I'm the festival director and I am absolutely delighted to welcome here today with us four fabulous filmmakers, um, directors of all four documentaries that are featured in our international shorts block one. Uh, we have with us Alexandra Maciejczyk, who directed Connected. We have, Hi. hello, we have Jamie Miller, director of Murbys. Hello. We have Jennifer Masumba, director of The Fish Don't Care When It Rains. And finally, Nastasia Popov, who directed Pickle Man. Hello. Now, let me also introduce to you our special guest moderator, my favorite special guest moderator, honestly, Mr. Charles Baldwin of the, of the Mass Cultural Council's uh, Universal Participation Initiative and a valued member of the Real Abilities Advisory Board. Welcome everyone. Thank you. So, Thank you. It's really great to be here and so exciting uh, to have the opportunity to chat with the, the four of you about these films. Such a wide range of, of topics that can fall under this umbrella of disability, a small word, but a lot of potential in the human variety. So it's again, very exciting to have you all here and have a chance to chat. Um, as Katka said, I, my name is Charles. I lead the Universal Participation Initiative at the Mass Cultural Council. And what that's really doing is thinking about the disability lens on systems change. So uh, this is, of course, a cultural gathering, uh, but I do think that uh, film and TV are such modern media that they really are often on the forefront of this cultural change. So again, thank you, Katka, for having me here today. Absolutely, thank you so much for being here. Um, I wanna start by going to um, Jamie, um, whose film, Urbize, is actually, and I don't know if you know this, the first film that was officially selected for Real Abilities Boston 2021. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. And I was very excited to do so, especially following last year's uh, fabulous Princess Tale, which you had screened with us uh, in 2020. Um, and, you know, I want to ask you, this, they're very different documentaries, they're very different um, shorts. Um, so I want to ask what it was, what, how you came upon the story of Murbys and how you decided that that would be the, your next film that you would make. And, you know, and incidentally, a film that um, brought you back to your very own Newfoundland. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, that was part of it. I think um, wanting... You know, I, I had been living in Toronto for about 10 years um, after moving there for school. And so wanting to make films in and about Newfoundland has been a big part of my life for, uh, since I started. Um, so part of that was wanting to uh, reconnect with working at home. Um, yeah, Prince's Tale was the first documentary I directed and that was very much, you know, like a, a, a portrait and I love that kind of style. And, um, but I wanted to try to do something a little bit bigger. Um, so Murbias is kind of like a lot of portraits at once um, and a portrait of a community to me. Um, uh, yeah, and so I think what was going on at the time when I was kind of coming up with this idea was Newfoundland in general had, there, there's a few stories in the news about homophobia, transphobia um, in smaller towns, especially. And, um, and, and that's, that's, you know, something that happens around the world. Um, uh, I noticed that when I moved to Toronto, I, that's when I learned so much more about diversity and um, you know gender and sexuality and all these things um, and I think that access to to understanding people who are different than you just maybe sometimes can be slower in, in smaller places with the internet like obviously that changes but um, but still like that that connection that like heartfelt connection is just can be slower when you're not around, when you're around people who look like you and think like you all the time, maybe, or more. So, so that was kind of 
the idea or the the motivation was just to try to I, I noticed that Mirbais was this big phenomenon back home and um, I was really inspired by previous models in it. Um, one in particular is a, a, a wonderful trans activist uh, in St. John's here. And um, I just thought it was such an interesting collection of stories. And I, I thought that would be a really great way to, it, it's, it's accessible for people like the laughter and the humor and the loveliness of, of the people just trying to do something um, is kind of an accessible way to tell stories of people with vastly different experiences and to talk about this really difficult idea of toxic masculinity that is hard for people, for some people to deal with. Um, so yeah, so basically <laughs> uh, a roundabout way of just trying to make something nice at home. <laughs> No, wonderful. I have a gazillion more questions for you, and I and I also want to ask about the you know um, representation of disabilities in, in in your film. But I also want to give a shout out to Wicked Queer, who is co-presenting uh, this film at our festival uh, because of the, well the queer content, some of which you mentioned. Um, so thank you, yeah, Wicked awesome. Queer, and Charles is um, part that's of. It, that's queer. a good segue because I do a little volunteering for Wicked Queer as well. Again, always this administration stuff, and every now and again a talk back and a chance to meet directors. Um, and there was something that you said, um, Jamie, that I really liked and I'm gonna toss it to, to Jennifer and thinking about your film, Jennifer. Um, one, congratulations on getting the Easter Seals Challenge. I've been following the Easter Seals uh, Film Challenge for a couple of years, trying to push people in that direction. So uh, brava, that was great and exciting to get you into real abilities. Um, one of the things that I really loved about your film um, and thinking again of the theme that might be connecting all four of these, um, certainly connection is one of those, but um, and just now thinking about laughter, uh, thinking about humor, uh, thinking about finding uh, joy as a part of these stories. And your film is certainly got that going uh, throughout, Jennifer. When you were making the movie, were you feeling that joy or was this something that you wanted to make sure got into the movie? Um, I'm a very like joyful person by nature. I guess it's, well, it's just kind of hard to, I'm always optimistic and that's just my personality. So um, those were like real stories that happened, like the pineapple thing really happened with the raccoon. And when I was writing my film, I said, oh, I, I purposely wanted to have humor in it because I know a lot of times when people talk about disability, they'll talk about the hard things or things. And I wanted to just show the small humor in my everyday life that's relatable to a lot of people. And so I added those elements on purpose, but they were like real stories that actually had happened to me. So I love that yeah. because I do, you know, when we're all, uh, when you put something comedic or humorous into the film, something that's light and we all laugh, suddenly we're all laughing together. Yeah. And that itself is a, is a, is a brief moment. Um, what sort of drove you to start capturing yourself and your story um, as a film? Um, well, I had been they I had been doing a vlog for about two years on YouTube, and so when they announced that it was a documentary, I was like, okay, I know how to do this. I do this like every day. <laughs> So um, I actually had a lot of footage, which was cool because we were allowed to use old footage. And um, I thought, I don't know, I just thought, well, why don't I talk about, I don't know, my, my, my everyday life because something's always happening. I think that's interesting or relatable. And um, I think because of my autism, I tend to see small details and observations and things that maybe um, um, no typical people miss. So um, I'm always finding things in my day that are kind of poignant. And so I just put that all together and made, made wrote that film. That poignancy really does resonate, Jennifer, it really does. Thanks. I, I wanna move ahead to the film that's probably 
uh, most different from Jennifer's film, and that is connected, <laughs> Alexandra's film. Um, you know, when, when I think about the things that connect all four films, because, you know, they're very different, but there are definitely some um, um, common denominators that I've been seeing. And, and one other one that I noticed um, is this idea of challenging assumptions that people have. And in, your, in the case of your film, you know, blind people aren't supposed to go skiing, right? <laughs> would, be the, would be the challenge that you pose there. But I'm also really interested in how you came across that couple and how you actually chose to make this film, your graduation film at the very renowned um, film school in Woods. Um, so speaking about that uh, uh, blind people shouldn't ski, uh, I've been to a festival in uh, Hamptons and I met this very crazy journalist that um, that made some Q&A with me and she said they're blind and they ski and this is <laughs> this is my fa favorite like question from from a journalist <laughs> she was so amazed <laughs> yeah people um people are quite shocked they think that this is like uh, something not very wise thing to do that it's risky you know that um, yeah that they shouldn't do it because they can harm their, themselves they can harm other people but if like if you love something so so much and the, something that fulfills your life um i think that there's no other way than to do it you know there's no other way to live than you know uh, than not resigning from what you love even if you have this disability or you have this um i don't know how to how to say it like if you're uh, locked in a box yeah you 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 still have to go out of this box and you know live your life there's no other way how, um, how did you find them uh this is quite quite a personal motivation because uh i'm a skier myself since i was very small it's like a family sport and my sister had she had a risk of loser, losing her sight uh, in the end, everything was was okay. It was just a, a wrong diagnosis. But I got scared because this is something what we do uh, together, and uh, we have this connection when we are together in the mountains. And I started to do some research uh, if a blind person can ski, and I found out that I could become her guide if she would lose her sight uh finally everything was okay but i got super inspired and i thought that it can be a great metaphor of love mm. and of relying on somebody because you have to really really trust another person to to ski with their directions and then it took me like one year and a half to find them uh, I, I searched through different communities centered, centered around sport, uh, Paralympics in Poland, in Slovakia, and finally somebody uh, told me about this couple and uh, I just went to Wrocław where they live. It's in the, in the southern Poland. I'm You're from Wrocław. It's the best city. My mom is from Wrocław too. <laughs> It's a beautiful city, yeah. I had no idea. <laughs> and very and very good people also, like Krzysztof and Viola, my characters. So I went there and it was love from the first sight. Uh, both ways, actually. We really liked each other from the very beginning and it stayed like this. And we're still in touch. I went to their wedding uh, because they got married uh, in the time when we were shooting. So yeah, this is how, how it started.
That's, incred that's incredible. I feel, I feel, you know, I, I, I have to say, I feel a little privileged watching your film um, among, you know, all my um, colleagues because I do speak Polish, and I think a lot of the the humor and the bickering that they have, you know, can be lost in translation to some degree. Uh, mm -hmm. But your film, you, you know, your film traveled the world. It 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 was shown in what more than thirty film festivals, and you've won awards. It's uh, and so congrats on that. It's it's really incredible. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, Katka, I did watch the movie again after we talked, uh, as I was explaining, because I wanted to see it again with under new eyes, and it it lightened up, and what seemed like oh heavy bickering just sort of became that jostling that for position that a, a couple does. Uh, and so it was really, I, I thank you for sort of giving me that perspective and sending me back to the movie a second time. Uh, <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Anastasia, I'm gonna move over to you and, and a brief, uh, so we can talk about Pickle Ma'am and or at least get that started. And as we're thinking about uh, humor and how that connects us, um, what is uh, love being something that draws you to the story, to the sight? Um, you are dealing with Arthur Cohen and his death, um, and yet it's in a story that is so affirmative and so filled with love and laughter. Um, how did this come about under your lens? Well, I don't, I see some parallels, um, you know, with Connected even, I, you know, my, I come from a Russian background, so I think that somehow there's always like this, you know, and even the intonation of the Polish reminded me of a more Russian bickering. And like, I think that, you know, it's just so endearing uh, to see kind of the love that comes, the you know, in those, in the darkest moments and like the humor that comes out of the darkest moments. And I think, you know, that was part of, you know, obviously I was so just, I gravitated towards Arthur because he was just this ball of energy. Um, but I think he really encouraged me to find, you know, first of all, he was funny even in these really dark situations, but he really, you know, told me that it was okay to, you know, capture the dark and the humor at the same time, if that makes sense. So yeah. I think that I just felt really comfortable or I felt comfortable like just being truthful in that way that it's, they're kind of inextricably linked. You can't, you know, and the story itself is, so, so actually I found that it was more helpful to lean into the humor and that's when, you know, the dark, you know, the harder, moments like they they just kind of speak for themselves if I let the humor kind of guide the way I told the story. That's what's so great about the film that you know your ability to 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 get so much laughter out of sort of the depths of you know tragedy and 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 death really uh, in a you know in a graceful and tasteful way is it's really it's really something special. Tess Cohen who's who who's Arthur's daughter yeah wrote the script right with you or you you worked on this together which which you know <laughs> inspires in the film yeah she's um yeah my best friend closest collaborator and it was a very interesting experience to you know since we've collaborated on narrative stuff and we had studied screenwriting together in college but this was such a particular situation so it was actually a lot of me you know push it a lot of push and pull because of course it was such a um you know it wasn't easy for her to even look at herself when she watched the footage so it almost made me have to think like as an outsider how would we write this because she wasn't she couldn't think as an outsider so it was yeah it was an it, it was a very unique process of collaborating because um you know, we kind of had to like remove ourselves from being so close to the material. Yeah. Um, do you do you guys have questions for each other? I mean, I, I'd like I'd like to see if if that's something that is organically happening here already. If not, yes, of course. Okay. 
Alexandra, hello. Uh, I have a question. I have several questions, <laughs> but I have a first question I have to Nastasia uh, about your relationship with your main character. I think this is something that's very intriguing. Yeah. Did you yeah. did you know him before as father of your uh, best friend? Yes. So he, so Tess and I met in college. So it was very much, you know, not like a childhood friendship or anything, but close off the bat. And then I met him. So it was this really, you know, crazy chain of events that right in our freshman year of college, he got diagnosed. So I met him, but very early on in his diagnosis. So he was still his like, you know, he was the exact, the guy that he used to be in a way. Um, and then, and then, you know, it just kind of happened naturally. We loved each other. Like, you know, it's just like, it felt like we really just had, you know, as you said, love at first sight. And then he was also a photographer and, you know, I'm this art, you know, I just feel like I, Tess always says I'm like the very intense artist. So <laughs> I think he really, he, he knew that I would benefit from like this kind of mentorship and him kind of like, you know, he was the one who even said stuff like, you should come into the bathroom with me and film me brushing my teeth, you know? So he kind of knew as an artist himself, like what would be compelling. So that I think was really helpful because it was really my first time making something so verite. I was like figuring out the camera as I was going. And so just to kind of have him as almost like a guiding force in in the cinematic way was it was I mean it was just like trial by with like trial by fire but with someone who clearly just had a lot of tricks up his sleeve so it was really cool <laughs> mm. yeah like this is actually it's a great character it's a it's a it's such a warm person <laughs> he was amazing and his wife. I mean, I love the whole family so much. So it was like a huge, you know, also I was kind of just young and working on my first film. So it was this, it felt like a big responsibility once he passed away and kind of to like shape, to do his story justice. So as you guys all know, with documentary, it took a long time to edit and figure out like, how do we really bring him to life? Jamie. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, this is something like with all of your films that I was thinking about while I was watching was just the level of personal connection. Cause like, Je like Jennifer's film is about herself. And that's such mm -hmm. a, it's such a brave, like to, to make a film about your family or people, you know, or yourself, it, it's such a challenging thing that I think about all the time. Cause I'd love to make films about some of my own family members, but like Jennifer, to make a film about yourself and to watch yourself and to uh, the the part of involving myself is the find of is the part I find the hardest. So like, how did you how did you do that? Uh, you know, edit all that stuff together um, about you, Jennifer, and then and and also with the other two, like, how do you start that level of trust that it's like, okay, I'm gonna go and do this with these people that I'm. Because Alexandra, I think that's that's another thing for you that I want to talk is like how you build that trust with them. But first, Jennifer, I'm curious about your your experience. How did I? I had to. I tried to like look at myself from another angle, not as I always see myself. I try to say, well, what would people want to know about me? And what do people not know about me that I know about me? And I try to share some of the more intimate things about myself, like where I've lived in the group homes and the mm -hmm. things that have happened to me. Um, but I try to show them from a way that I didn't want it to be like, oh, poor me. Like I'm making a video about a documentary about myself and then just feeling bad for myself. I wanted it to be te um, teaching people like another way to think about things. Mm -hmm. So I think that's how I did it. I thought, what would I like to teach people and using examples from my life? 
Mm -hmm. You even say, I mean, it's a quote from your film, art provided a better view of myself. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's so fascinating. I, honest, I honestly think that anybody who's thinking of making a film about themselves should first watch yours as a reference. <laughs> Aww, thank and, you. And also to do what you, what you do in, in under five minutes, um, you know, with, with, with so much humor and, and content. Uh, and, with, and, and actually, you know, we, we, we're screening a feature length do documentary about autism at the festival called In a Different Key, which I, you know, I highly encourage that you all see. Um, and it's, it's probably the most all en en encompassing film on autism that was made, um, you know, today. Uh, um, and here you are creating this film under five minutes. Mm -hmm. that teaches that teaches people who don't know anything about autism so much in under five minutes and it's incredible and i'm, I'm just and i'm in awe of of your you know of your filmmaking skills and and just the the way the way you wrote it uh, thank you so you know something my brother taught me he gives me nuggets of advice all the time and he told me people will remember the way you made them feel they're not going to remember like oh, the camera angles and all that, but they're gonna remember how they felt when they finished watching that. So I always keep that in mind when I'm telling a story or writing a song is how are people gonna feel when they um, when they consume this? And um, I think that, that helped me along a lot, a lot of the way, his advice. Oh, um, I love that advice. I, I, I'm gonna take that advice and think about <laughs> that. Yeah. I have a quick question for Jamie because now, um, Jennifer's subject obviously is herself very close. Alexandra, you've mentioned you still have a relationship with the couple. Nastasia, I'm sure you're still friends with the Cohens. Um, Jamie, do you, what about Hassan and his Mirbais? <laughs> Are you still connected to them in some manner? Yeah, well, I mean, in Newfoundland, everyone everyone knows each other. Um, <laughs> we're on an island, we can't get far. Um, but yeah, I mean, it will, it's interesting because that's, well, just to quickly touch on what Jennifer was just saying, like thinking about, you know, people remember the way you make them feel and not if the camera angle is perfect. That was like a huge challenge for me in this film um, because I was trying to, I, I was at once building these like friendships with these, these folks I was filming. Um, you know, I met, I met with Hassan, um, like I don't know half a year before we started filming and and it's very easy to become friends with all of them so I had I, I was feeling this pressure of of I want to tell all these stories mm. uh I, and it was really hard for me to choose whose story to tell <laughs> um and and then I was putting all my own pressure on myself of I want it to look really good. I want it to sound really good. And, and I was also, because it was, you know, our funding could only allow me to do, to follow so much of, of this big event that was happening with their, uh, the making of the calendar. I, I, start, I was filming a lot of it myself, which I was, um, hadn't done much of, uh, like a, as, as recently, like I used to, do cinematography in school, but I'd been away from it for a long time. So I, I, I had like tons of self-imposed pressure while I was filming with these guys. Um, anyway, so that's off topic of your question, but, but it, it's something I had to force myself to learn um, was to just focus on the way it felt. And so like I, I met most of the models in their audition process. Um, you know, there's that scene of of them sitting down in front of the camera, in front of the uh, Mirbais organizers. And, and they're so sweet and so genuine and nervous. And so it really came through like just the lovely qualities of each of them that I could immediately start like building stories around. And so then I interviewed a ton of them, um, like say 10 of them afterwards in their homes. Um, to try to see like who I'd be able to work with and and so I just like I ended up making a bunch of friends you know um, and it's it's been a tough year following the Mirbais uh, like finishing up 
the film because we didn't even get to screen it all together. You know, I haven't, I've, I've ran into Hassan a bunch in town, but um, I don't really get to see any of them now because because we're all, we've all been, you know, isolating. Um, but, you know, we follow each other online and stuff and, and some of them are just doing such great work pushing themselves to try to be like connected with people. I think that's kind of the point of Murbai's is to try to build more connections um, within. Sh you know, Sheldon, the who's featured in your film, who, who has physical disabilities, he, he just put out a book. Yeah, yeah. So he was working on that while we were filming and he's put out his book, um, Keep On Walking, I believe it's called. Uh, it, there's a bit of a longer title to it. Um, he loves writing. He loves connecting with people. So I've, I've actually run into him a bit um, because he's a big volunteer in the city. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's kind of um, it's talk about disability. It's just like, that's, that was kind of the point of them to broaden who they, whose stories they told and who they featured in their calendar because, um, because they wanted to be able to connect with, like, like give people an opportunity to connect and, and people like Sheldon who really just wants to be part of as many communities as he can be. Yeah. Um, and then you have John, who's so, such a sympathetic character. Yeah, he's so lovely. Yeah. Everyone, everyone gets so moved by by John's story. I was crying when I was filming with him. Best um, dad ever. Yeah, uh, such a good dad, and, and he's so open. Like the first thing he said in that audition was, you know, the the mental health challenges he has, and and then as soon as I was talking to him in his house, he just he's just open and he's talking about it, and he's taught and he continues to push himself to just try to reach out to people. And, and so like, I really hope that I get to um, spend more time with all these guys because they're just so lovely. Such a complicated relationship though. That's why I'm really cu curious about Alexandra's relationship and like how she built that because it's, it's such a strange thing telling someone else's life story, you know? In a yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. Um... I wasn't thinking then about, you know, building a relationship. It somehow came naturally for me then. I think it's maybe easier when the film is so conceptual. And uh, right now I'm making a, a long documentary and it's, it's, it's supposed to be more psychological and it's much harder and it's really harder to build a, uh, this trust mm -hmm. and with connected i i uh i talked with krzysztof and viola what's what's my concept that um i want to like show a relationship through this um through this connection through this connection but connection on skiing that i don't want to portray specifically their relationship. I want to do it through their uh, activity together. And, uh, and Krzysztof said that uh, I can shoot them uh, on the hill, no problem, but no going into the house that like per personal stuff stays inside. And I was totally fine with it. I wanted to shoot only in the mountains and so on. And then we went uh, on a skiing trip together to shoot. And of course we had marvelous time. I, I even uh, was, sometimes I was his guide. I got the Bluetooth kit and we also got connected through it. And it was <laughs> amazing to guide someone. It's like a double pleasure that you ski, but you also uh, can give someone skiing in the same time. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. And of course we had some wine in the evening and the good food in the mountains and stuff. It's like all, all these things around skiing, uh, only good vibes. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said uh, that he invites me and my DOP to their wedding. 
and uh, we said, okay, so we want to give, make you a gift and we will shoot a film like a, you know, wedding video uh, for you. And then they said, if you know, if you want to use this footage, you can put it in the film and you can put whatever you want. Mm -hmm. and, uh, then we had even too, too much footage. Uh, so we re really had to think about the concept again. And finally, we went to, back to the origin that it should be only in the mountains, only foggy weather, only, you know, black mm -hmm. and gray. Uh, and uh, yeah, and and um, and we had to limit ourselves uh, then, but but without gaining this this trust, I would also, I think that I wouldn't be able to shoot these um, conversations that they have in the beginning when they go uphill, and this is something uh, that we shot in the second winter because we were shooting it. Uh, in two winters time times see, like two winter seasons mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the, this part was in the second season and it was uh, when when they already felt more comfortable with us so yeah but uh, but back then I, I it was somehow very organic process of of gaining this trust uh, I wasn't, you know, making a strate strategy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah it's, it's so different. Every person you work with in documentary, I think it's, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, I have a question. Oh, go ahead, Miss Lazar. It kind of, you know, it sounds like what Alexandra just uh, referred to as sometimes limitations can be helpful in a good way, like, in a way. Um, so Jennifer, I'm also curious, like at what point did you come up, you know, your title is this, you, you know, this poetic metaphor as well as there's a metaphor in Connected. So I'm just curious, like at what point in the process did you come up with that guiding force and like it seems like whenever you make a film about yourself, it's also the options are infinite. So I'm wondering if that helped like root you in something. Absolutely, because when I was thinking, what should I shoot about myself? Well, I've been on this planet for 44 years. There's so much I could say, but I had to come up with a snippet of my life. And The Fish Don't Care When It Rains is actually a song that I had written a few months oh. earlier. So I was trying to think how I could incorporate my music into a film and I thought, well, that song really tells a story and has a theme to it. Why don't I see what I can write around that concept? So mm. I took the song and the lyrics and I thought about what it, what it really meant. And then I wrote my story all around the song, which of course I included in the um, thing in the film, but if it wasn't for that song, I don't know what concept I would have come up with. So it, it's a good lesson too to always be creating because you never know what one thing might lead to yeah. another thing. And you're certainly right when you have too many options, it's harder to be creative. But when I narrowed it down to this song, okay, I'm going to tell a story around this song. It really helped me focus. And I just wrote that script and I just knew in my heart, like, this is the one. Mm -hmm. One of the things that Jennifer, you, you say in your film, that's my favorite, absolute favorite is that take is about this idea of taking those abstract feelings that, you know, that we all have and writing them into a relatable tune. And I think that's just so beautiful. And I think it really is actually pertains to all of the films that we're talking about here. And with that, I'm really curious uh, to hear what it is that you're working on next or what have you done since the film that we're, done, that we're discussing? Because I know that that's probably the case for some of you. Um, and I, I wanna start with Nastasia. What's, what's up next for you? Um, well, I made, Tess wrote, uh, narrative dark comedy short film and so we've shot that in 2019 and I completed that um during the pandemic 
which is ongoing. Um, but I, so working on getting that into festivals and then I'm writing a feature film, very much a self portrait, but, you know, leaning into the comedy, the laughter through tears, because I think that's really, I feel like, you know, it's also writing a feature is so much about finding your tone, like what tone, you know, is true to you. I've, you know, done a lot. I'm now on the second draft. So it's like the first draft was this process of just throwing it all out on the page. So now it's like simplifying, which is why I'm, you know, my question really had to do with like, how do you simplify a story? Um, that's really what I'm thinking about right now. So just, you know, look out for that in maybe a few years. <laughs> and that's a, that's a narrative. It's a narrative feature and, you know, rooted in like document. I think I have such an appreciation for documentary, but I also like my goal is to do a sort of docu fiction where it's like a lot of the characters are themselves but it's, you know, there's still a structure and like maybe more of a plot. And maybe that's just my attempt to give myself some sort of limitations that are achievable <laughs> rather than I think with my style of documentary, unfortunately was not so, you know, streamlined. And this is how I streamline my process. Jamie. What's up next for you? Yeah, um, well, I really relate to needing to set limits on myself because that's kind <laughs> of, uh, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't work that, that simply either. I, I mean, I think that was my issue with Murphys <laughs> is I wanted all the ideas to be included and I wanted all the people to be included. Um, but we, I mean, we got it, we got a nice film, but I, I still have flashbacks of all the things I left out. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so have a little, a few, COVID kind of made me um, have a bunch of ideas that I wanted to start. And now I'm like uh, feeling all of the half started ideas, um, calling my name, <laughs> like sitting on my shelf. Um, but I, I got a grant uh, from the local St. John's Women's Film Festival, which by the way, I'll do a quick shout out. Um, submit your films to them. It's an amazing festival made by, uh, uh, it, all the films are made by people who identify as women um, or non-binary. And uh, it's a local, it's been running for like 30 plus years here and it's incredible. So- um, What's the name again? The St. John's International Women's Film Festival. Okay. Um, Jen Brown is a great lady. Um, so submit them to that. Um, they, I, I got an award uh, from them that is to make a narrative short, which I'm supposed to be filming this August. Um, so I, it's the first script I've written since, cause I didn't really write, I focus on like documentary and experimental stuff in school. And so, uh, so it's a new thing for me um, and I'm really scared about it, but I'm working on it. <laughs> and uh, I'm excited for that. That'll be, Hopefully it'll get made in August. And then I have like three different docs that I'm, tr I'm trying to make docs about my grandmothers and my father <laughs> and uh, some other things. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. congrats. Good luck. Thanks. <laughs> Alexandra, what's up? What's next for you? I know that you actually, you made a film with a script that um, Justina Bielik wrote and I know her because you know oh. we're from Poland so we all know each other no we don't but I happen to know her uh, <laughs> and so I'm, I'm really excited to see that because I haven't had a chance to see it yet um, I can and, you a screener. <laughs> thank you. and I know that that's out I don't know how how well it's doing I don't know if it's if it's gone around but uh, um, it went to Polish film festivals in Gdynia so this is like the the most important yeah uh festival in poland so i think it's going pretty well I'm, I'm happy with it yeah amazing amazing what's up next um so i'm working on a uh, on a long length documentary right now uh and it's about polish aristocracy nowadays 
um, yeah and the second thing the second biggest thing is that I'm co-writing uh, the the feature narrative um, about um, a cult in Norway wow <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Very interesting. <laughs> we can't wait. Honestly, <laughs> can't wait for all of this. Um, and I also started to write on my own. That is quite hard for me because I've been always working with a writer or like directing someone else's script or uh I'm talking about narrative. Um, or or writing with someone, and now I'm you know I'm writing it on my own, uh, so it's a challenge. <laughs> but I'm writing a, a short uh, about uh, it's gonna be a like um, absurd comedy about eating disorder. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> That's in, that's intense. Good. Quite crazy. Good, good, luck, yeah. good luck with that. Uh, Jennifer, I know that you have, during the pandemic, put out a music album, and I'm sure that you're working on a gazillion other new things as we speak. Yes, my mom always says I have a lot of irons in the fire, but I don't like to miss out on life anymore because for years I was kept out of life and now I'm in life and I want to just do everything. So it's like when you let a kid just pick anything in, in the toy store, that's what I'm like with life. So I actually have a script a short film narrative called Elephant in the Room, which features four disabled characters who go on a heist to steal a Pez dispenser from a local memorabilia shop. And none of them know the others are disabled until they actually meet. So um, I'm excited. I've gotten some really good feedback on it. And I'm just waiting to see if I can get some funding and the producer, because I'm going to have to get actors. And then my other project, which I can work on on my own is well this year was the next year for easter seals it's a new year so uh, i can't recreate the magic of the fish don't care when it rains but i made a mock it was a mockumentary this year i made a film about me and my dog and actually i'm going to turn that into a web series and i enlisted the help of a couple actor friends and we're just going to shoot it i'm going to shoot it in my house and uh, make a little web series just for fun and see where it goes from there. So that's my media projects. And then one more thing is, a lot of my songs are stories from my life. And so I'm always thinking, how can I turn this song into a short film? So there probably will be more short films based on my songs coming up. We honestly can't wait. Charles, do you yeah. have closing remarks? Please, my friend. <laughs> closing remarks. Wrap it all up. Closing <laughs> remarks. Well, uh, again, in, in thinking about all of your films and hearing how you uh, built them and where they come from, places of, of love and humor and almost by chance sometimes as you go looking for these stories, I guess the my, my encircling concept is really this, and I think you kind of mentioned it, this connection. It's obviously in the title of Alexandra's film, whether that is connection to self, connection to one other person, connection to community, connection to family. And so um, film festivals are a way to connect us to new stories that we're not familiar with. And even though the audience isn't sharing the space right now, it is an opportunity for us to connect um, with each other around these stories and these discussions. So thank you very much for participating in this today. How was that, Katka? That was a pretty good wrap up. That was, that was, that was pretty good indeed. Now let me do my official festival wrap up of this conversation. I want to thank you so much again, uh, all of tonight's guests. You can watch all four of these shorts at our festival from May 6th through the 13th as part of International Shorts Program 1. Do check out International Shorts Program 2 as well uh, for some fabulous shorts that are the highlights from Real Abilities International selection this year. 
make sure to check out the full lineup with eight wonderful feature length films that we have this year. Register for a free pass. You can stream all films for free online throughout the festival week. Do also join us for our live Q&A panels with guest filmmakers, subjects, and actors. And once again, many thanks to our panelists today. Stay safe and see you all very, very soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Sweet. Bye.